Okay. Uh, back to the second part of the lecture two. We are going to talk about EDM a little bit, and then so we know there are um, two things actually in surveying are legally traceable, as we know is the cadastral part of thing, which is EDM. They recently started to bring some GNSS into cadastral. That's why they had to regulate GNSS usage for cadastral as well. So we're going to go through that and make sure we follow the standard. Uh, we all know about EDM, yeah, electric distance measuring uh, equipment. So uh, most of the time for any EDM calibration, we need to compare it to the baseline, which does have regulation 13 certified. For example, if you come to our Toowoomba Long Range and do the EDM calibration, is it acceptable? No, <laughs> because it's, it hasn't been re-verified for many years and it's so out, yeah? So it, we don't have any new, new Regulation 13. We did have it in the past, but we haven't maintained it very well, so we can't really use it for any purpose. Um, so I shouldn't really draw. <laughs> it looks funny. Anyway, distance calibration in Australia, I just quickly giving you a little bit of history. Like we used to have a chain, yeah? To calibrate the chain, they used to use invar tape, yeah? And then we started to have the EDM. Do you remember automated EDM was on top of the total station? So it was an individual unit. That's why is it stayed as it is, like as individual part of the uh, total station measuring the distance. And they used to do like frequency chain, uh, check for the microwave to calibrate. Very first baseline uh, was started in 1917. Uh, it's interesting to know the very first one was actually in Brisbane Airport, you know, and the person who established that was actually the very first head of the School of Surveying at USQ. Uh, there's also an award in surveying under his name. Don't ask me his name, I forgot. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, so. In 1918s, so they started the baseline, you know, everyone could go to baseline and compare, but they thought there was too many variation in how people actually setting out the baseline, yeah? So they started to formula, formula, uh, formalize, sorry, baseline procedure and installation and what are the rules and regulation and uh, in, in a way the traceability of the EDM or distance measurement. In 1990s, we started to have total station. Yeah, total station became more precise than what we used to have as a separate EDM unit. So they started to think, okay, we need to have more precise baseline to start off, yeah? So they, they changed the legislation in a way to be more precise. From 2000 now uh, onward, we have robotic total station, which makes life challenging for the government and authority to maintain the baseline precision because they're getting better and better and better. Yep. Um, and I can see one day that actually our total station is as good as our baseline. So because most of the time your baseline setup should be much more precise than your actual instrument accuracy so you can identify the errors and uncertainty. If your baseline is less precise, that's not good. Do you agree? We can't really check it. Like, for example, I'm measuring the distance with the tape, you know, and say this is about, you know, five meters. And then you, you come and you want to calibrate that distance for me using the total station. Does it make sense? Do, can you calibrate your instrument based on what I measured with tape? No way, because total station is much more precise, you know, in a way. It depends on which tape you're using. Not in VAR type, obviously, I'm just talking about normal type. Uh, anyway, the Section 20 of Surveying Mapping Infrastructure Regulation uh, actually require any surveyor to calibrate the equipment, uh, especially the EDM, and they actually wants us to use the base on with the Regulation 13 certificate. Who is actually issuing the Regulation 13? DNR, DNRME now. Now they added energy. So they keep adding the letter. Who knows? It might come with 10 letters at the end. They, they, were, they were DNR. When I came to Australia, then they said DNRM. And this year they are DNRME, <laughs> which is good. They try to be 
broad as broad as they can. So anyway, DNRM uh, is in charge of the issuing the certificate. Yep, yeah? but they actually follow the National Measurement Act. Yeah, which is a national uh, measurement institution in Australia. So they follow that rules and regulation to issue the certificate. Actually, Chris and I, you know, Chris, Chris and I, we set up the base for uh, because we didn't have any baseline to be used for ADM calibration at Springfield. Uh, this year we went and we tried to set like a very short range, like um, half a kilometer, and then we actually contact DNRM and they gave us the guide, like there are certain distances you, you need to have. You can't really go and set up the baseline as you wish. There's like a certain requirement for the distance. Uh, not that we did a great job because we didn't have the instrument. Yeah, we try to, you know, simulate what we can have as a baseline and we measured as many times as with too, too many instruments so we can come with a good average or number for distance. Um, anyway, it's actually a very interesting area to look for. Um, I've seen students doing like project on that, like what would we, because you can see the EDM calibration varies from one, one state to another. Some of them, like in Queensland, we have seven stations. If you go to New South Wales, it's about, do you know Chasm? I don't know, it's, it's four or, yeah, it's much shorter as what we have here. Um, so it's one of the things we may look at, like whether we need to have national thing as one one standard for EDM calibration or not. What what happened in future, these are the things I'm going to discuss a little bit. Here's the thing I told you, EDM is only providing you the um, traceability for the distance. It doesn't mean if you have EDM certificate, your angles are also good, so you have to do separate testing for the angle. Are we good? How often we need to check it annually? Uh, when the equipment is sent to the service and also when you have some, you know, for example, you put your total station at the back of your car and someone hit your car from the back, so you really need to send it for ADM test because that kind of may change uh, or affect the uh, ADM equipment. This is the same diagram I've got in the past. I just simplified that and also I did it with Australian terms mostly, like the terms that you, you can uh, identify here yeah, this time. For example, I told you who is in charge of the ADM calibration is DNRM E. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so uh, we are here as a survey. We're just checking against regulation 13 and then they adjust that. ICSM also is kind of working very closely with DNRM E guys. They are uh, also in charge of, you know, um, changing and modification of the ICSM documents because there is a whole document about how you can set the uh, ADM baseline, you know. Okay, so I know you might know about the ADM, but I, I actually want to show everyone because I don't know everyone online also see that. There is a whole website about EDM calibration. Let's say EDM KLD. Okay, if you go to um, Queensland government website, there is a whole section about legal traceability of your distance measurement and how you can do the comparison between the baseline. There is a list of baseline. Here's the thing I, I think it's not really good. We have very limited baseline. Queensland is really a big state. Uh, and for example, if you're in Brisbane and you want to do EDM calibration, the very closest one is Kabucha, yeah, which is about two and a half hour drive, am I right? Or two? Oh. oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty hard, yeah. So that's why I think there is really a need to have one in Brisbane at least somewhere. Uh, so it, it, it makes life easy. Anyhow, I think the reason they don't have too many because there is a cost attached to maintaining the baseline and it's going to cost government, so that's why they have to actually have a limited number of baselines. Anyway, let's go to this document. This actually documented the procedure you have to undertake for EDM calibration, for example. It actually tells you... 
I wanted to show the diagram. Okay, have a look. It actually tells you even in which sequence or order you have to take the measurements um, and all those details that you need to do. And we have a software for it. So what you do, you fill the booking form. Yeah, you put all the detail, and then you you do the you put it in the software and you process it. It generate a report for you. So it's not really a difficult procedure. What is difficult to understand the report and see whether it's good enough or not, or whether you have to send it back to manufacturer. Anyway, let's back to our to our lecture. One of the things I want to uh, tells you is uh, I want to tell is how how we actually know our baseline is good. Like I'm going and setting out the baseline. You know, how do I know? what I install or set out is good enough to start off. Based on the document, uh, based on the national standard document for the EDM baseline, there is a certain uncertainty or limit, yeah? minimum standard you need to achieve for the distance measurement, uh, which is this one, 4 mil plus 20 ppm, good. And what they use, they actually have to use the instrument which has the accuracy of 1.15 mil plus 2.45 ppm. So you can see it's very precise, isn't it? Yeah. So there is a requirement for instrument uh, and minimum. It might change because our instrument is getting more precise. So you always need to check and see which one is you have to use. Uh, so simply we set up in this case where I'm setting out the baseline 1.1 k. Yeah. 50, what's that, 100, blah, blah, yep. And then you measure each of them with this instrument. We can simply calculate the uncertainty, can I? It's 1.15 mil, it's plus or minus, yep. Uh, plus 2.45, multiply 10 minus 6, multiply your distance, yep. Sorry, this is in one whole thing. <laughs> So I may write it again here, just in case someone not being confused. Yeah, this is how we get these uncertainties here. And minimum standard is coming from the this 4 mil plus 20 ppm. It's the exact same procedure. And if it's less than what we are measuring with instrument, if it's less than the minimum standard, we are passing. Yeah, there's no gross error or anything. And that can be go for the further uh, certification and stuff like that. Good. When they want to re-verify the base, th this one was for verification, yeah, to setting out the baseline to start off. If they want to re-verify, they have to actually use the instrument uh, more precise than what they got initially. Yeah, are we good? Uh, you can see it's very precise. Can we setting out the baseline with set up the baseline with, for example, Trimble or Leica instrument that we have, like a normal one? As I don't know, so no way. It's two mil two ppm. It's not really that precise. That can be used for this purpose. Anyway, so based on the resolution thirteen um, for the baseline, this is the uh, minimum. Because when they did the baseline, they used this type of instrument, yeah? So, very precise one. They actually increase it a little bit to account for any uncertainty. So, and they say, when you are testing or re-verify the baseline, you actually had to meet this, yep. So, this is the ma uh, minimum um, standard for that baseline that you have to meet. So again, you do the instrument specification, you compare with the baseline, and if it's less than that, it's kind of passing that. So don't worry, do not, this may or may not happen to working with the NRME on the baseline. And we actually have a few of our, our students are actually working. So it's not like you're never going to see these stuff, so that's why we are trying to cover it. Um, anyway. So let's summarize what we've learned about EDM. What are the requirements? First of all, they should be minimum 1K. Yeah, they agree. Um, they also say it should be in a stable ground. That's why we have concrete pillar, you know, to make sure they're not moving. Um, they actually um, 
larger states like Queensland, I definitely think that we need to have more baseline um, because the maintenance and re-verification of the baseline is not something easy and they have to do it like every so often to make sure the, uh, the baseline is operating very good. Um, it actually may co incur, uh, kind of uh, incur them with the cost. That's why we don't want that or government doesn't want to have too many. Here's the thing. Have you ever thought why they developed the software? Not only they developed the software to kind of uh, have a consistent, you know, analyze for the uncertainty and everything and they can easily issue the certificate, but also they can archive all the information from everywhere. So if 100 people, they do the EDM calibration on, let's say, Kabucha baseline, they can have 100 times of checks from different people. And then they can find out if there is any one mark is out, then they go and they try to find out what's going on. So it gives them the option to maintain easily. As I said about the cost and also it's time consuming. Yeah, the processing, it takes time. Have you ever done EDM calibration, anyone here? How many of you have done it? Three, okay, that's good. Four, okay. So it's pretty easy, but it's taking time. Do you agree? You have to spend like a day, go there, measure, and come back. And usually what companies does, uh, they do what they put few instruments at once so they can calibrate two or three total stations at once. Anyway, uh, the future, I think, uh, government has to kind of support the calibration network, whether they're going to privatize this function to give it to private company to look after and contract them, whether uh, we're going to have some of the baseline, like Toowoomba is no longer can be used, uh, so whether we're going to have more baseline or not, that's another question. Um, so I told you baseline is only for the distance. Don't think that if you have the EDM certificate, it means that everything is all right. Why do we need to have a long baseline? Is there any idea? Mm. Because what we are measuring, let, let me know, what are the two terms we want to get from the EDM calibration or two pounds? Yep, prism constant and scale. Do you agree? So. For prism constant, you can even have a shorter distance. You know, that's why you can easily get it even from the three-peg test if you do a simple check. But for the scale factor, you really need to have a long distance to be able to get the scale factor correctly. Um, the increasing the precision for the total station, as, as I said, especially the robotic total station, uh, kind of make the uh, calibration or EDM calibration somehow redundant, uh, but we still need to be able to check it somehow. So whether it's going to be a new approach for checking the total station or not, that's another question we have to ask ourselves and something you may want to do research about. Um, do we need to think about new regulation for laser scanning or new technology like UAV as I said or not? That's some question government needs to ask. Are we good? So we finished with EDM. So no question from EDM so far? It's pretty easy, yeah? So we get to GNSS now, which might be a little bit new to you. So GNSS can be used for cadastral purposes. What, are, what, what is the main element in cadastral is length, yeah, or distance. So we need to have length or distance traceability. But here's my question. What GNSS is measuring? Does it measure distance for you? <coughs> No. It only measures position, yeah? So it gives you position uncertainty. And you have to find a way to interpret or transfer that positional uncertainty to distance uncertainty or length uncertainty. So to start off, uh, we are looking at the positional uncertainty. So it's not really the uh, distance. I gave the whole section in the study book. You can go and have a look and read through. I'm not going to cover it in the lecture simply because we don't have enough time, yep. Uh, uh, what I thought is the main point to know, I put it here, so it's the main thing I believe everyone should know. When you're talking about the GNSS in cadastral purpose, let's say I have 
right on drawing here I may add new slides so I can draw it later I explain it first and then we go and we try to visualize it yeah so you have point A and B for example and then you want to measure the distance between them or yeah or length between A and B so I go with my GNSS device I sit there I don't know for six hours I don't know how many hours one hour depends on on what type of precision you're looking for for a so you obviously go for long hours to get more precise um, and then I sit down and get the position let's say I go to B I do the same can I do like static or can I should I do like uh, correct for you know should I do RTK should I do PPK <coughs> that's one main thing you always need to have a reference station yeah to correct for all those uncertainty why do we need to have a course or you know reference station what's the point of having them correct for error like do you remember atmospheric error um, timing error that you've got from GNSS measurement having reference station helps you to identify those and it can be corrected yeah we've talked about that about in um, intro to GPS hopefully you remember some of them uh, anyhow let's say I need to connect to calls network yeah so I go to a I connect to let's say what are the two um, I know for example in the Springfield the two calls network near Springfield is Ripley and Ipswich yep I connect to Ripley I connect to Ipswich for A you always need to have two connection to two known marks it can be those known marks can be like calls network yep in national uh, geodetic network so I have three ways to go the very first way for A I connect to two calls network course one course two they can be any closest to you so and these courses station are part of Australian regional GNSS network which is actually maintained by Geoscience Australia Geoscience Australia is the body uh, who is in charge of all the course uh, certification and also uh, geodetic Australian national Ge national geodetic network anyway or <coughs> So I do that, and then once I've done my measurement, I send it to OSPOS. Yeah, you, have you used OSPOS? Yeah, Good. So you send it to OSPOS, and it does the processing for you, and then it gives you the result. Yeah, for the A. Or I can connect to the calls network, but not necessarily in the national, because we have a national calls. We have like regional one here yeah? or local one. You can use two calls network in your regional network but remember they need to have regulation 13 for calls stations yeah we have two type of regulation 13 we have regulation 13 for ADM baseline yeah we have regulation 13 certificate for calls network or alternatively you can connect to two permanent surveying marks yeah on a GDA datum uh, they also need to be registered in Queensland as a permanent survey mark. It's not like I see this mark, I feel like this is permanent, I can go and do whatever I want. It's not like that. So anyway, let's, let's visualize that. So I have A, I have B, yeah. So what you do, I have, for example, uh, Ripley here, I have Ipswich Cores Network, so this is Cores 1. Course two. So far, so good. I have reference station. It can be any. I put R and I as a Ripley and Ipswich initial. Initial. So what I do, I measure the baseline between A and the course network at Ripley. Yeah. So it gives me this position for A. I do the same. This time, I'm using the Ipswich as a course. Give you a slightly different position. Do you agree? It's not going to be the same position, I bet you. It's going to be slightly different, not by much, by a few mils, you know. And then it happened to this one as well. Might give you a slightly different. Are we good? So what we want to achieve? So 
So you have uncertainty for a thing and no thing of each of these points. You have to kind of get the relative uncertainty for this baseline. This is the one thing as a cadastral purpose we are looking for. We are looking at the relative uncertainty between point A and B. Yeah? I don't care about the position. On, I do care, but it's not something is for legal traceability. We are looking at the lens. Yeah? So you have to interpret that. How do you interpret that? Simply by error propagation. Yeah? So you have positional uncertainty for each point, then you can calculate the relative uncertainty between A and B. There's a whole document on that. Uh, I'm sure, or I'm not sure, <laughs> whether Peter is going through. Um, but if he doesn't, you better have a look at it. Uh, I will show you which document is that one. There's an ICSM document. You can have a look and see how it, GNSS can be used for cadastral purpose. Maybe Glenn is going through that. I'm not sure about the cadastral course either. Anyway, uh, if you're looking at the ICSM document, there is a focus or emphasize on using least square and more and more, even for GNSS purposes, like you do GNSS ops, you do level leveling and then you combine them, you know, and then you do the adjustment for them. I'm pretty sure you've done similar thing in comes B. Have you done any? Or Peter does it, I'm pretty sure in uh, uh, genetic B, the combination of the GNSS and level one or conventional. So I put the GNSS legislation. I'm not going through those texts. That's why I highlighted the area I want to look for. So I told you GNSS for having a traceability, we need to have a physical quantity. Yeah, Physical quantity in GNSS is the position of the point. And uh, what actually it gives you as a traceable measurement is the position of uncertainty. But we are actually looking at the relevant uncertainty between two points, which is um, interpret as a length of the point. Yeah, This is just summary of what I told you. Um, I also told you Geoscience Australia is in charge of verification or authorizing the COS network uh, or Australia Regional Geodetic Network. They are also in charge of issuing Regulation 13 certificate. But here's the thing. They issued a certificate but ICSM is the one who gives you what are, what are the uh, correct procedure, you know. They don't tell you how to do it. They just say, this course is good to go. It can be used. It's certified, you know. And then ICSM comes and say, here's how you need to do your control survey if you do, or how, is, how you're doing your cadastral survey if you want to use GNSS. Okay, I already told that GNSS... Um, some people are still against using GNSS in cadastral survey uh, because they say, oh, well, we should use it, you know. Uh, we can use, you know, conventional surveying. Um, that's sometimes right. That, uh, I think GNSS is getting better and better. In future, I will see is more usage of GNSS in cadastral. Uh, that's my opinion, personally. But here's the thing. When you do GNSS... Uh, when we work with GNSS and we say, oh, I've done this for how many hours and I've got this result as an uncertainty, everything looks pretty good. You have to always remember this is location dependent as well as time dependent, yeah? GNSS, depends on which time of the day you do GNSS, you get different results. Let's say I use the same instrument, same position. If you go a different time of the day, you get different number of satellite, different satellite constellation, which gives you that different answer. So it's very time dependent. It's not like EDM I'm doing once a year and peace of mind, yeah? It's not like that. You have to always do the planning for GNSS. It's also location dependent. Like let's, let's say I want to use cadastro in CBD area. Do you use GNSS? I would say no, because lots of tall building, yeah? Multipath error. Here's the thing you have to think of. Okay, I told about the Australia Regional GNSS Network. They actually uh, recognize as a reference standard or they also will be called value standard. Uh, if you ever heard value standard for GNSS, you know which is from Geoscience Australia. It's about Australia Regional Geodetic Network. I told you about the uh, time dependency of the GNSS. I already discussed that, so I'm not going to spend more time on that. Uh, 
So I told you Geoscience Australia is just issuing the certificate. Still, the state government are in charge of um, giving you the pr correct precision and best practice to use them. Um, here's the deal. When, when they talk about the using GNSS in cadastral purpose, um, they don't tell you the position or uncertainty you have to achieve. They say, have a look, let's read it together. The regulation uses current terminology like ICSM SP1, I told you special publication one, to describe uncertainty and it placed the onus on the surveyor with guideline blah blah to ensure uncertainty in position can be translated. Do you remember I told you we get the positional uncertainty and then we have to translate it to uncertainty in length? Yep. Uh, what is the requirement for cadastro is that length uncertainty should be plus or minus 10 minutes plus 10 ppm. That's a requirement. Um, whether you can achieve it or not, as I said, depends on the time, location and everything. Not, not, I can't really say for sure, for this area, I can always achieve it. There's time dependency as well, you know, if you have this many of the satellite, blah, blah. So let's see what are the general comments and issues we've learned about Queensland Regulation in our lecture. First of all, uh, we're good with ADM. We know it's applicable to the lens and it can be used. Uh, we talked about uh, calibration process for ADM, but there is no actually guideline for proper use of GNSS. They started to having that. Uh, if you ask me, it's not really as documented as ADM procedure. Whether they need to have more document is something we have to see. Um, Geoscience Australia is in charge of the Regulation 13 of the Coins Network, but they don't give you the procedure. Procedure comes from ICSM. Yep, I told that. Um, so traceability, I told about location dependency of GNSS, that depends on the location as well as time, yep. So you have to be careful when you are using that. So far so good? Okay, now I'll tell you a little bit and then we're going to have a little bit of break uh, before we start the third part of this lecture. Uh, what time is it actually? Okay, so we better finish it here, yeah, we have 10 minutes break, and then we do the third part. How about that? Sounds like a plan? Okay, I stopped my...